So, uh, let us begin with our very first lecture for the season. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce James Lefanu. He studied the humanities at Ampleforth College before switching to medicine, graduating from Cambridge University and the Royal London Hospital in 1974. He subsequently worked in the renal transplant unit uh, of cardiology departments of the Royal Free and St. Mary's Hospital in London. For several decades now, Dr. Lefanu has been a regular medical columnist for the Sunday and Daily Telegraph. Now, I first became acquainted with uh, Dr. Lefanu from our former dean of the School of Medicine, James A. Pittman, back in 2000, who handed me the first edition of Dr. Lefanu's book, and as only Jim Pittman can do, and if you remember Jim Pittman, this will be definitely in character. He never suggested that you read anything. He handed me the book. He says, you're a historian. You need to read this book. And I did. And uh, I soon realized why Dr. Pittman was so emphatic about my reading it. It contained everything Jim loved in a book. Insightful analysis served up with large doses of history and spiced up with just the kind of controversy and bold conclusions that made you, whether you agreed with them or not, pause and think. Well, I'm happy to say that Dr. Lefanu has a new edition of that book out. And hopefully we will be having a book signing following this lecture with copies available. So I will simply say, without further ado, let's welcome James Lefanu as he presents the rise and fall of modern medicine. Um, right. Thanks very much, Mike, for those kind words. And the invitation to the Magic City. Uh, it uh, might, or indeed does, seem perverse to talk of the rise and fall of modern medicine. When I was writing this book, uh, as you can imagine, I spent a lot of time in the library at the Royal Society of Medicine in London. Uh, and my presence there, you know, day after day, sitting in the same seat, files of books, side to side, naturally elicited the curiosity of some of my fellow library users. Uh, and when I was um, on several occasions, when I was just minding my own business, doing a bit more photocopying, photocopying another article, uh, some people come up and say, well, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? And when I told them I was writing this book called The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine, uh, it, it produced a certain sense of bafflement. Because, of course, everybody knows about the rise, the supreme, uh, it, one of the supreme epochs of human endeavor, you know, the extraordinary achievements of medicine in the last 50 years, but they just didn't get the bit about the fall. <coughs> But the most schematic outline of the major landmarks of the last uh, 60 years reveals a very, very distinctive pattern. Where from 1945 and onwards for the best part of 30 or 40 years, there was a firestorm of innovative drug discovery and technical innovation um, that peaked or plateaued in the early 80s and creating an intellectual vacuum it was being filled by a very different view of the aims and priorities of medicine. Now, this is, interpretation is, of course, of interest of its own account, but as, um, as the great English writer, I hope his words, uh, uh, G.K. Tesson famously observed, history is a high point of advantage, from which they then can see the age in which they are living. And from the high point of advantage, look, looking back over the past 60 years, this also makes sense of, in many ways, the curious um, uh, um, problems, or not curious, which would seem to be contradicted by medicine's uh, success. And um, you know, one, of the, one of which is that doctors are, for some reason, rather less satisfied with their prof prof professional careers 
Then they used to be, as for clear by this particular slide, I hope this works. Oops. And here we have a series of doctors, a series of uh, cohorts being asked, you know, do you have any, do you regret your decision to become a doctor? And here we have back in 1966, and you could imagine extrapolating this back where uh, the answer to that question is less than 10 percent, and you can imagine extrapolating back, back, back in the 50s, where people just wouldn't have understood the question. And here, and as a sort of decade by decade, there's this sense of a sort of sense of disillusion. Now, there might be many reasons why people might not be thrilled by their, uh, or might have regrets about their chosen profession, but this, I think, is a provides an interesting insight into the, you know, the changing tenor of medicine and, and then also associated with that, the further paradox that despite the extraordinary success of medicine in making, in making our lives so much better and so much easier in a way, people paradoxically are now much um, uh, more worried about their health than they used to be. So here we have a few older people in 1968, asked whether they believe that their health was improving or deteriorating. And in 1968, that most vast majority thought they were improving, and only a small percentage thought it was getting worse. And you know, 20, 30 years later, an enormous reversal of that interesting second model. So these things, you know, it's possible that the changing pattern of medicine as of other other world disease might, in a sense, illuminate these important trends. So anyway, I to begin. And when I start with a sort of schematic outline of the major achievements of major landmarks of medicine over the last uh, 60 years, and uh, there's a lot of data on the following two slides, uh, but I will, as it were, draw to your attention the major, the, the major, um, uh, land, the major uh, category. So we start, of course, with the assault on the, the major assault on infectious diseases, and here we have penicillin in 1941. Uh, we have uh, the cure of strep TB with streptomycin, the PAS in 1950, uh, child immunization, polio vaccination. Uh, and then there are the you know, major the therapeutic discoveries which have trans transformed the practice of medicine. Uh, cortisone in 1949. Um, what do we have here? Somewhere here is the oral contraceptive pill. Um, there is chlorpromazine for the treatment of schizophrenia. Uh, Hormone replacement therapy, or some separate pills, neither did for Parkinson's in 1961. And then in addition to that, there is the uh, major developments in technology and surgery, which opened up the possibilities for uh, treating many of the uh, chronic problems of aging. We have intraocular implants for cataracts in 48. Um, uh, Operating microscope, which makes so, such a difference to so many different disciplines, mm. and um, kidney transplantation, child and ship replacement, uh, and coronary bypass. So, an extraordinary epoch of, of, of change and innovation. And then, as we go on for, for the next two, uh, uh, the, the subsequent 30 years, of course, there's still important things happening, but there's a very strong sense of, you know, sort of slowing down this rate of innovation. It's very important, the cure of childhood cancer, which I'll come back to in 1971, we introduced reduction of these imaging techniques, the CAT scanner in 1973, the first test you gave in 1978. And one which we'll talk about right at the end, is a very significant discovery of the character back to the community. Now these, of course, uh, each of these, is an extraordinary story of human life, which would merit an entire hour-long lecture on its own. But um, I, which obviously, my purpose really today is as to try to draw out some of the reasons which lie behind uh, this extraordinary and, in a sense, such uh, extraordinary uh, epoch of human achievement. Uh, and we start with the two central pillars of. Uh, of the therapeutic revolution, and they are the introduction of antibiotics, penicillin, the cure of infectious disease, and uh, uh, cortisone, which treatment of inflammatory disorders. Uh, and we start, and so uh, in, in, in 1941, uh, Albert Alexander, uh, an Oxford policeman, was the first person to receive penicillin. And several weeks earlier, he had been, uh, while pruning his roses, he scratched on the arm and scratched and turned septic. Um, and uh, he was now, uh, as his 
um, Dr. Uh, Charles Fletcher described it um, pathetically and desperately ill with his vast cavitating lesions in his lung. Uh, and I put it, penicillin therapy was started every three hours. All Mr. Alexander's urine was collected, and each morning I took it over to, over to the pathology laboratory on my bicycle so the excreted penicillin could be extracted to be used again. There I was always eagerly met by the members of the penicillin team. On the first day, I was able to report that for the first time throughout his illness, Mr. Alexander was beginning to feel a little better. Four days later, there was a striking improvement. On the fifth day, the supply of penicillin ran out, and Mr. Alexander's condition deteriorated, and he died a month later. Regrettable indeed, but a reminder to future generations of that crucial transition moment, transition moment between human susceptibility to infectious disease and the ability to thank the science. Now, of course, uh, you know, we all know that the, uh, the origins of penicillin lie with the fortuitous discovery by Sir Alexander Fleming of, its, uh, uh, of the inhibition of bacteria uh, by a, um, a, a contaminated mold of penicillin nitratum, which he, of course, famously failed to pursue and failed to dip to Sir Howard Florey and Sir Ernest <coughs> King at uh, uh, Oxford University to turn to, in the early years of the war to transform the Oxford Department of Pathology into a penicillin factory to produce uh, uh, penicillin in sufficient quantities for them to produce. Now, we now know that, of course, that penicillin was not just a lucky break and that um, over the subsequent 10 years, the screening of tens of thousands of them bacterial organisms identified virtually the full range of antibiotics in common use today, <coughs> which will be familiar to all of us in fact practice on phenol, tetracycline, cephalosporins, and mystatin, and so on. There are three points, I think, that can be made about the antibiotic revolution, which within a sense we are familiar, but which need to be emphasized. The first is the, is the comprehensive. Uh, there are, as we know, hundreds of different infectious diseases, from sore throat to tuberculosis, but there's not a single, which is not treatable by one or other. So, today, the microorganisms that produce them are incredibly simple, but the antibiotics themselves, chemically, are incredibly complex compounds. We exert their effect through a whole variety of different ways in experiment production of DNA. Experiment, the production of hormones and the proteins and enzymes and so on. And the third concerns their role in nature. The conventional view, of course, is that antibiotics are produced by, organ, by microorganisms as part of the process of chemical warfare to maximize their chances of survival. But this man, uh, 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 this, but this man, uh, 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 Waxman, Sinner, says, Dan Waxman, who discovered <coughs> uh, uh, streptomycin's treatment for tuberculosis, uh, after a long series of uh, investigations, realized that this could not possibly be the case. Particularly because the concentration of the antibiotics in the soil uh, was much too small for them to have any significant problems. So the, uh, he concluded that antibiotics were a purely fortuitous there is no purpose behind it. The extraordinary proposition, which I will come back to in a second, once we have considered the second figure, which of the uh, revolution caused it, uh, from Sydney, you might know, by the chance observation of a 65 year old man with, rheum with rheum severe rheumatoid arthritis, um, that uh, to his physician, I put a hench here, that during a recent episode of jaundice, his rheumatoid arthritis had fallen. Hench inferred uh, that the body must, the effect of jaundice must have been to, to, to <coughs> compel the body to produce some potent anti inflammatory compound, which, uh, together with this man, Henry Kendall, he spent the next 20 years investigating what it might be, and turned out, as we all know subsequently, to be cortisol produced by the adrenal gland. His administration to the first uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, recorded in the following uh, um, uh, the following event. Uh, at a meeting in April 1949. 
The lights were turned down and a colour film began flickering on the screen. First became, came the before treatment pictures, in which patients with characteristically deformed joints struggled to take a few steps. Suddenly, an electrifying grasp swept through the audience as the single quote after treatment scenes appeared, and the doctors saw the very same patients drawn to the inclining steps, <coughs> swinging their arms and legs, and even doing little jigs as if they had never been crippled at all. Even before the film ended, the watching physicians had filled the hall with wave after wave <coughs> of resounding applause. Now, it turned out the cortisone was not a very effective treatment for, for rheumatoid arthritis because a high dose is required at unfortunately side effects. But it seemed logical that such a potent, to investigate the possibility of such a potent compound in the, in the treatment of various other conditions. And indeed, over the subsequent 15 years, Nearly <coughs> 200 diseases were identified as being sensitive to pseudohepatitis. Uh, which includes large lungs of blood disorders, the grade of particularly connect, connected tissue disorders, eye disorders, gut disorders, <coughs> neurological disorders, skin disorders. The crucial point about the established point is that it permitted doctors to, as it were, pull them to a very about the nature of the cause of illness. Uh, and by the simple expedient of writing a prescription for cortisone, uh, anticipating that, <coughs> that that patient would improve as a result. <coughs> cortisone and penicillin transform. But their mode of action remains profoundly anti-vaccine. Uh, and uh, they could never have been, as it were, synthesized from first principles. And it seems to me that they are best conceived of properly as gifts from nature, as Vaxman suggested, too profound and too complex to, to, for our, to understand what happened or even now. And they had two further extraordinary, they had two further benefits, two further consequences. And the first was to encourage doctors to believe that, to realize that it wasn't necessary really to understand the nature of illness in order to come up with an effective therapy. Because, but rather that, as with penicillin and cortisone, uh, the observation in the research in the laboratory would, as it were, generate this cornucopia of, um, of, 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 new, of, of new treatments uh, <coughs> without, as I suggest, the need for a profound understanding of the nature of the And over the next 40 years, 40 years I've witnessed uh, this cornucopia of drugs. Uh, we, know, we know about this in a way, but once you put, as it were, put it down on a slide like this, but begins to get the sense of the extraordinary nature of that achievement. Um, and here we have 1940, 1950, 60, 70, and here we have the major categories of disease, infectious disease, cancer, psychiatry, rheumatology, circulatory disorders. And in each of these, <coughs> this vast um, collection of enormous number of drugs uh, were discovered during this period and by that time. Man uh, Paul Beeson, who many of you would have known, know, um, uh, editor of the um, classic textbook, te textbook Cecil's um, Textbook of Medicine, uh, uh, subsequently commented, in going through the first edition, that was in 1927, I will come up to be impressed by the paucity of available drugs. Many medicines have simply disappeared, strychnine, arsenic, of course, tincture, capsicum, only about 30 drugs mentioned in the first edition are still in use today. The 40, by the time it came to editing the 14th edition, uh, in the mid-1960s, he was able to talk about, uh, identify 86 anti-infective agents, 5 anti 10 synthetic steroids, 35 other hormone preparations. Uh, <clears throat> the second aspect of Consequence of, of it seems to me, of 
penicillin and cortisone was to encourage a sort of an optimistic <coughs> belief amongst doctors that even the most intractable of the illnesses might be curable. Uh, and sustained them in that belief through many years of vicissitude and disappointment. And the 25-year uh, protracted research for in search of a cure for um, Charge of cancer, the charge of cancer, acute lymphocytic leukemia, exemplifies this part. Uh, and it all starts with this man, many of you, is a Sydney, uh, professor, Sydney farmer, professor of pathology at Harvard University, who in 1946 made the observation that an antagonist of folate, uh, folate antagonist, folate antagonist, produced a temporary emission in children. Univer the university fate of acute lymphocytic. Yeah, acute lymphocytic leukemia. Subsequently, it emerged that Philip Hinch's cortisone was also an effective end. It was also useful in inducing remission in these children, as indeed one of these fortuitously discovered antibiotics <coughs> actinomycin C. And then, in a chance observation, the leaves of the periwinkle plants that emerged had a, a therapeutic effect against these malignant cells the white cells, and uh, uh, resulting in the discovery of being Christian. Each of these, <coughs> each of these uh, uh, drugs uh, produced it, could only produce, produce a temporary remission. And so we suggested that perhaps they should be given a combination. It is impossible to convey the physical and psychological trauma this regime imposed on the young patients <coughs> and their parents. Each dose of treatment was followed by nausea and vomiting of such severity that many children were unable to eat and became malnourished and stopped growing and ceased to put on weight. Then there were the side effects caused by the action of the drugs, which not only poisoned the leukemic cells, but also the healthy tissues of the body, the child's hair fell out, the mouths were filled with painful ulcers, they developed chronic diarrhea, and societies. It's not for nothing that can always be described as proper effect. It's extraordinary to think that doctors pers persist <laughs> with this entirely toxic um, yeah, despite uh, only uh, first producing a temporary <coughs> uh, this illness in, in acute lymphocytic. But they did persist. And that combined with the introduction of maintenance therapy resulted in these first cures which improved the, uh, the survival rate in children from 0.1% in the 1954 cohort to, 19, to that to 40% in 1974, and now as we all know, it's somewhere up here. It seems to me to be an extraordinary state of mind. I think it reflects the extraordinary optimism uh, that uh, that doctors could have um, uh, um, uh, persisted with this treatment for all these years in anticipation that ultimately it would have been And I'll very briefly talk about, as it were, the second pillar of the, uh, of the this golden age of medicine, which was, um, was in a sense almost antithet antithetical to this fortuitous. Uh, discovery of drugs, uh, and that was the um, the uh, devising of technical empirical solutions to uh, to certain well-defined problems. And um, see, it is, uh, and uh, they come in three major categories: familiar, the life-sustaining, intensive care, ventilator, dialysis, pacemakers, diagnostic, which already mentioned, CT scanners, PET, PET scanners, cardiac catheterization, surgical, joint replacements, lens implants, um, the heart a lung machine, the pump, which I'm going to mention again in a minute, endoscopy, and so on. Um, unfortunately, I can't deal with it in a time me to, to deal with anything other than just to outline some of the, you know, or just to mention some of the personalities involved. And uh, so here we have 
John and Mary Gribben with the prototype of the open uh, of, the, of, the, of the heart lung machine, uh, which would uh, permit a fix. John Kirkland, uh, a great star of the uh, yeah, of, of, uh, of, of, of the city, of course, and uh, uh, Walter Lily High of uh, Minnesota, over a period of ten years to perform the full range of open heart operations, repairing congenital defects in children, replacing disease valves, and so on. And then we have here uh, uh, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Murray in the background here, performed the first successful kidney, kidney transplants on the Herrick twins, Richard and Richard and Richard and uh, Richard and Robert. I'm not quite sure which one is which, because of course they're identical. <laughs> uh, the operation was performed on the 23rd of December, 1954. The kidney functioned immediately. So James Murray, the background, so it's from the report. Richard Herrick's recovery was rapid and complete, exceeding our highest hopes. Within a couple of weeks, he was well enough to be discharged from hospital and promptly married a nurse who looked after him in the recovery in the recovery room after his operation. <laughs> and something more Patrick Stepto of Edwards, uh, whose uh, 12 year long uh, uh, research program resulted in the culmination of the first test tube baby, Louise George Brown, in 1979, the first of tens of thousands of subsequent benefits from the process of the future. <clears throat> there is so much. The most significant uh, inference, I think, from uh, uh, this incredibly schematic outline of this, of this early age of medicine is how, in a way, it contradicts the common perception of medicine as being on a continuous onward and upward curve of progress driven by a profounder, an ever profounder understanding of the nature of the disease. On the contrary, as we have seen, many of these important insights were essentially fortuitous, and the uh, chance discoveries, and um, or the, uh, or in relation to these technical discoveries, um, the, uh, the empirical solutions to well-defined problems. <clears throat> Science, of course, was a very vital role, instrumental, a vital instrumental role. But it seems to me that the main impetus behind the rise of medicine was primarily a moral one. And that it lay in the moral, human qualities of determination, moral courage, sharp observation, imaginative thinking that made, that made possible. This extraordinary, this most extraordinary evil. And then, sometime in the late 70s and early 80s, it began to seem as if this glorious period was coming to an end. The um, journal Nature commented on what it described, described, described as the dearth, of new, the dearth of new drugs, this precipitate decline uh, in the 60s. Uh, early 70s, and the number of new drugs which were coming to market. The following year, um, <coughs> Colin Dollery, who is a professor of pharmacology at the Royal Postgraduate Medical School, uh, chose as the uh, title of the prestigious lecture, The End of the Age of Optimism. And this is what he said. Problems seem larger and solutions to them more elusive. The morality and cost effectiveness of scientific medicine has been challenged. Many people, including some of the most senior of the medical research hierarchy, are pessimistic about the claims of future advance. The age of optimism has ended. And then the following, James Bingarden, who's president of the American Association of Physicians, chose as the title of his presidential lecture. Uh, um, the, um, the, clinical science, the clinical investigator as an endangered species. And this is what he said. 
There has, he observed, been a declining interest in medical research amongst medical students and young doctors for several years. Clearly visible to the heads of professorial departments who increasingly find their recruitment tool get smaller each year. Now, there might be, I mean, there might be several reasons for this change in tenor in uh, the uh, medical enterprise. But what it certainly did do was it created a sort of intellectual, a sort of intellectual vacuum uh, that would be filled by two very, what would become very influential disciplines over the next 20 years, but which not up to this time had not played a terribly important role in the rise of medicine, and they were epidemiology and genetics. Um, and I will tell you, the first is, the first, uh, what I call, contribution of epidemiology, it's the social theory, the notion that um, uh, many common illnesses are simply due to the way in which we live, or what we have for breakfast, and that they are therefore readily preventable. And the second is the, the, the new genetics, uh, uh, which arose from a whole series of really important technical developments in the late 70s, which allowed Genetics for, genetics for the first time to identify the, ge the genetic cause of disease. And I'll deal with each of them in turn. So we start with the social theory. And um, there is, of course, no doubt that people smoke and drink too much and have a healthy diet and don't take enough exercise will live shorter lives than others. But the point about the social theory and epidemiologist claims was in the uh, 70s and in the 80s and onwards was much more ambitious than that. It went further to claim that there were specific aspects, the specific aspects of people's diets, what they were particularly the high fat diet, you know, familiar in the Western world, um, that was uh, specifically responsible for uh, heart disease. And here we have a, a, a humorous outline of this, you have the Japanese down here with a very low rate of coronary heart disease and the unfortunately overeating uh, American colleague uh, who as a consequence of his overindulgence has this much higher rate of coronary heart disease. So as we're all familiar with that. And then in the, uh, uh, simultaneously, uh, these two very important uh, um, epidemiologists, Richard Dole and Richard Peter from Oxford University, in a famous profile, of the, in a famous monogram, the cause of cancer, came that 70% of the cancers in that summer were um, due to uh, were due essentially to the Western diet. 70% of non-smoking related to cancers. Uh, simultaneously, um, there were a whole series of uh, uh, epidemiological observational realizations suggested by this by, by the estimating number of studies from the nurses' health study, which identified virtually the full range of every, everybody's, full, full range of people's lives in some uh, uh, potentially lethal disease or other. So alcohol <coughs> discriminated in breast cancer, eating too much meat with colon cancer, and drinking coffee with, coffee with cancer of the pancreas, and so on. And, so on. <coughs> and even the inanimate objects, you know, you know, electricity pylons, and, um, Mobile phones were incriminated in some disease or other. Well, of course, it's impossible to evaluate the validity, or otherwise, of these extraordinarily ambitious claims, uh, which were predicated on the notion that, essentially, the practice of medicine was irrelevant. All you had to do was get everybody, everybody to change their lifestyle, avoid all these, you know, terrible things going on around them, and, you know, somehow or other, they wouldn't live forever. It is, however, possible to um, uh, uh, the, sorry, I must just mention this is, as it were, summarizing uh, the uh, anxiety mongering, which was so prevalent, which such a prevalent, such a prevalent feature of the social theory. And here we have exercise factors, stress, red wine, 
according to a report released today, can cause heart disease, hypothermia, feeling well-being, depression, in to income families, arthritis sufferers, rats, and overweight smokers. So one can get a bit. Now, as I say, it's very difficult to evaluate the significance or otherwise of any of these claims, but I think it's important to note, interesting to note, that the most influential the notion that somehow or other the epidemic of heart disease was a direct consequence of uh, people's unhealthy lifestyles, and what is evaluated uh, presupposes that uh, there should be some sort of correlation, at least, between the changing pattern of heart disease and the changing pattern of food consumption over a period of you know, 40 or 50 years. And here we have the, 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 um, uh, the pattern of heart disease the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, here we have 1915. This stretches back to the 1930s uh, and then peaks in the 1960s and falls equally precipitously. And this, and this has now fallen down to uh, this, these graphs, and now have fallen down somewhere around this area. And we see there's absolutely no correlation with the change in consumption, which is not to say that, you know, the might be more than one way or another. To have too high a cholesterol. But the essential point was that the extraordinarily ambitious things made on behalf of the you know, wickedness of uh, 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 harm caused by people's patterns of food consumption was probably unsustainable. And now to deal finally, very briefly, with the new genetics, predicated as, uh, as, you, as I have mentioned on this. Uh, uh, extraordinary series of the very important technical developments in the 60s which allowed the uh, genetics to mm, chop up the strands of DNA into small part bits and then produce lots of copies of them and then sequence them, uh, culminating in the um, uh, supreme, extraordinary genome, spelling out all the genes and the human genome in uh, um, into that. Genetics research will, like a mechanical army, systematically destroy ignorance. Promises unprecedented opportunities for science and medicine. We are familiar with this rhetoric, extraordinary claims made on behalf of the new genetics and the idea that by understanding the illness at this really profound genetic level, that this as a well will take us to the new. Uh, as it were, open up whole new homes um, of uh, treatment. Well, as we know, it hasn't really come up. Uh, and um, indeed, the contribution of uh, genetics and to the Human Genome Project uh, to clinical practice is virtually non existent. Certainly makes very little, very has no, no, no impact on, on ordinary, everyday family practice. I just want to summarize very briefly three aspects of that. And the first is the um, uh, biotechnology and the contribution of the new genetics to the development of new drugs. And here we have a classic example, the insertion of a gene uh, into a uh, bacterium in order to produce prodigious quantities of some desirable human hormone like um, uh, um, uh, such as insulin. And although certainly it's been technically incredibly ingenious, it must be said that this contribution of biotechnology to new drugs has been a fraction of that uh, achieved by the uh, pharmaceutical industry and researchers in the 40s and 50s. Um, and indeed, as the head of um, uh, Genentech uh, once uh, famously observed, biotechnology uh, has been the biggest money-losing industry in the history of mankind. Uh, and the second possibility, much vaunted possibility of the genetics, was this idea that you might be able to prevent genetic diseases by antenatal screening and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, selective termination of aborted feces. Here we have uh, the, one of the many missing mutations responsible for cystic fibrosis. And here again, Regrettably, the logistics involved to prove to be 
much more difficult than anybody could have imagined. And it's interesting that cystic fibrosis, and we've known the genetic defect responsible for cystic fibrosis since 1989, that's almost 25 years, and there still isn't, despite the claims for it, a screening program for it. And then the third is the, uh, is the, uh, is, uh, is a gene therapy, this simplistic notion that one might somehow other be able to uh, uh, remove the defective gene, a bit like sort of blending a car engine and putting a, 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 a correct one in this child with a rare auto, a genetic autoimmune disease. And the trouble with gene therapy, as we all know, is that unfortunately it just doesn't work. That's how I So that, in a nutshell, in a very brief nutshell, is the rise and fall of the modern medicine. And it's reasonable to ask why it is that the recent past, particularly epidemiology and social theory, and new genetics, have proved to be so disappointing. And I think this takes us to the central, unanswered, unresolved question which lies at the heart of medical enterprise. It becomes apparent when, as it were, one reviews the overall achievement of the last uh, 60 years. And that has essentially been to drive or to push the burden of illness to the extremes of life. Whereas medicine of one extreme has reduced infant mortality to its irreducible minimum. Children who die from prematurity or genetic disease. And then at the other extreme, medicine has pushed the burden of disease uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the other extreme of life, where most people now are privileged to live out their natural lifespan. Um, the vulnerable, of course, to the chronic diseases associated with ageing, which medicine can palliate, but cannot cure. And they include the circulatory disorders like stroke and heart disease and cancer, because cancer is primarily an age determinant. They include arthritis and cataracts and uh, <coughs> dementia. The medicine can do something about it, but it cannot resolve. And the point about seeing medicine having, as it were, driven the burden of illness to these extremes of life is it brings into focus with extraordinary clarity the unifying principle of what it is that we don't know. And that is that all the illnesses which are not age determined, which can occur at any time of life, that's multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes and <clears throat> all the skin disorders like some viruses and um, all neurological disorders and so on. The unifying principle about them all is that we do not know their cause. There must be a cause. There must be a reason why somebody that gets multiple sclerosis or somebody that gets rheumatoid arthritis. But we don't know what it is. And it's certainly not genetic, although of course there might be a genetic element, but these are not genetic. And they're certainly not environmental or social, because there's absolutely no difference between the dietary pattern of somebody who gets multiple sclerosis and somebody who doesn't. And here it seems to me the uh, experience of this man is very instructive. He's a very martial. At the age of 27, while working at a research uh, uh, while working at a researcher at the Royal Perth Hospital in Western Australia, I identified these organisms, Alicobacter, as the cause of lactic ulcers. <coughs> and the effect of realizing, of recognizing that lactic uh, ulcers and gastritis is primarily an infectious disease and treating it accordingly has the most unbelievably profound effect on the illness. So if you treat it with antibiotics, your emission rate is virtually 
Това е търъци в мене, в нещо. Това е търъци в мене, в нещо. Това е голямо написание. И те ти не знаят, но не са. Да майте да ви покажат. Не са от това не са. Но ако не трябва да имаме какво диференци ще направим, ако ние можем да разбираме натура на кола, Illness is like multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or diabetes. In the same way that we now understand yeah, the cause of uh, cancer. Then one could anticipate that sometime in the future a further you know, golden age of medicine where uh, one could, as it were, diagnose and treat these, treat these illnesses and there's no reason why they shouldn't be treated. Uh, just as effective. So with that, on that, Queensland.